our kind of theme or sermon series for the Sundays in Lent is being honest with God and being honest with ourselves. And as we look today, we're looking at this passage where Jesus meets Nicodemus, and that is in John chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it. But you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony." If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish." but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray to You this morning. We pray for enlightenment, we pray for a sense of your spirit to be with us, to come upon us, we pray to be born from above. Let us truly understand what that means for our lives, how you do create us anew in Christ Jesus. We pray all these things in his holy name. Amen. Well, if you look at the Gospel of John, as we have the Gospel reading from today's lectionary reading is uh, from John's Gospel, and we have this wonderful story of Nicodemus. As you read John's Gospel consistently, you see themes of light and darkness all throughout. And so you also hear words that clue in to these themes of light and darkness, like day and night. Day referring to the light, and night referring to the darkness. And so, as you see this, we come to understand that the light, of course, refers to what is good and being kind of in God or in Christ uh, when we talk about being in the light. And the darkness is contrast to that. We see that is the antithesis of being in the light or being with Christ. And so, it is when evil is done or when we stray away from God's will, we see darkness. And you see this very important word with Nicodemus. Uh, coming. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was a leader. He was a, a member of the Sanhedrin. Nicodemus later intercedes with, for Jesus with the Pharisees in chapter 7. And we see him kind of standing up for Jesus. And then even later it mentions Nicodemus a third time in the 19th chapter after Jesus has been crucified and Nicodemus goes with Joseph of Arimathea, whom the Gospels call a secret disciple, to bury him. And it refers 
to Nicodemus, just like it refers to him here in chapter 3, as one who came to Jesus by night. It mentions that in the third chapter. He's coming to Jesus by night. It may have been difficult for Nicodemus to follow Jesus or really to kind of say, I want to hear what you have to say during the day when others can see him identifying with Jesus, maybe sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to Jesus. Because Jesus was not all that popular with the Pharisees. Nicodemus seems respectful. He seems curious. But he also plays it safe. He, he wants to play it safe. He believes and yet he's not sure exactly who Jesus really is. And so he comes to Jesus in the night, not really ready to go public with his interests. He claims that because of the miracles that Jesus has performed, he must have come from God. You must have come from God. And then Jesus begins to share of this concept of being born from above. Classically, we've heard it in many translations as born again. And we see what it means to be born again or born from above. And it has a lot of uh, baggage with it in the, from the 20th century and into the 21st century of, of being born again. And yet, this idea that we see anew that by being born of water and the Spirit, and referring in a sense to our baptismal uh, waters, and the Holy Spirit that we receive at our baptism, that to be born again, or born from above, born anew, is something very different. It's a spiritual context that Jesus is talking about with Nicodemus. And Deborah Capp, who is a seminary professor, she says this about it. She says, Jesus likens the faith of Nicodemus to that of a child still safe in a mother's womb. You must be born again to declare this faith in the light of day. He's not really ready to do that yet. Born again, born from above, is to look at the world and look at our faith through God's eyes, to begin to see as God sees rather than as we see. Let's take, for instance, the law. We had this wonderful law given by God, and many people followed the law. But if we follow the law strictly because it's a rule and we've got to do it, we're not, in a sense, born from above. We may grumble about it, and we say, well, we've got to follow this law. We can't eat that because it says it in the law. We can't do it. And we say, it's crummy. I'd rather eat it, you know, but we've got to do it. So we grudgingly follow. We have it there. We accept it, but we don't really understand it. To be born from above is to embrace that law and to see how that law is given for us to really be closer to God, to do God's will and to actually allow God to work through us in this world, in this life, to share the grace of God with all people, to bring others to the light of Christ. If we see the law in that way, it becomes a very different thing for us, and we can embrace it because we understand it fully. That's what it is to be born from above. Let's look at the rules of cleanliness, for example. They were uh, strict about this, this idea of being clean and unclean and the categories and you could do a lot of things to make yourself unclean. So there's a lot of rules we have to follow. But the idea behind this is that we're taking our faith very seriously. We see God as some other and holy and we know we're not. And so by following this ritual and the rule and the practice, we are able to somehow set ourselves apart from others in the world and to say we are intentional about being with God. And it's a very wonderful gift to really be able to take that faith seriously and see that. But when we make the rules so rigid that people who are, would be unable to keep them because of their profession or, or their social class, we're all of a sudden keeping them at arm's length and they are not able to come and be with God. And that's what Jesus is seeing in all of the things he's doing and bringing in all of these people who would be considered unclean. And when we allow the ritual to become the most important part rather than our communion with God, it's we're not seeing the forest for the trees. We're missing out on the bigger picture, the larger idea that God is holy and other, and yet God is coming to claim us. God is coming to claim us. 
That's the most important part. That's the idea of what all these rules are behind. And so being born from above allows us to look at these things and see them for what they are. To remember that we are created in God's image and not even sin can keep us from that in Christ Jesus. As we understand this, we are born from above. And we can embrace this if we continue to come to Jesus by night. Sometimes, as we look at John 3.16, probably the most famous text in all the Bible, uh, for God so loved the world. You know, and I remember growing up when we'd watch football on television, you remember in the end zone, there's always somebody with the John 3.16 holding up a sign. I don't, know, I don't guess they do that anymore. I've not seen that in a few years. But I remember growing up, you'd always see somebody in the end zone Every, every game holding up John 3.16. And um, I don't know whose job it was to do that, but somebody had that job, I guess, and, and would be out and doing that. And it, it's in a sense saying this is the crucial claim of the Gospels, which who's, who's going to argue with that? Certainly. However, I think that we do it a disservice if we make it all about belief and take away the context of this idea of being born again or born from above and the action that it represents. And we have, if we look at the context, in the lectionary reading, we end at verse 17, but verses 18 through 21 really go with this passage, and I'd like to read them uh, here to you. This is continuing on. Do we have that on the screen? Here we go. This is um, verses 18 through 21. Let's advance it up one. It says, Those who believe in Him are not condemned... But those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. You see, we see here, it's talking about deeds, and we have this theme of light and darkness, and we have to understand that belief leads to right action. It doesn't just mean that, oh, well, we believe, so it's, we're good, God. That's what it's all about. No, it's about how our belief in God, to be born from above, leads to right action, to look with a broader sense of the vision of how God sees things so that it makes a difference for how we live our lives in the world. But so often, we divorce ourselves from that idea, and we think it's only about belief. And when we do that, we're going to Jesus by night. During Lent, it's important for us to examine this issue of when are we going to Jesus by night? When am I doing that? Holding up the mirror and looking at ourselves really firmly, asking ourselves spiritually, that's what this is all about this season, to really examine ourselves before God and say, God, when are we not claiming you as we should? When I was uh, at another church, there was a brother and a sister who were in the youth group, very active in the church, and uh, they started getting their parents to come. And it was confirmation time, and so I enrolled them in confirmation. They both decided to come, they, and they were good at being there each week and, and learning the lessons and those kind of things. The parents were coming some. They were from a little bit different tradition, the Assemblies of God tradition. And at the end of the time, on our confirmation Sunday, they were set, all set to join the church, and the parents were going to join as well, and everybody was, was uh, going to be a part of this. And... I ask all the kids, have you been baptized yet? You want to find this out. If they have been baptized, we confirm their vows that they'd taken when they're infants or children. If they had not been baptized, I baptized them. And so when I came to Nick and Nora, I asked their parents, you know, have these children been baptized? Have these youth been baptized? No, they haven't. Are you sure they've never been baptized? Oh, no, no, they've never been baptized. Okay, we'll baptize them in the service. And so we did, and wonderful confirmation Sunday, big service, had a lot of people there. And at the lunch, we had a nice 
uh, potluck dinner afterwards, a celebration time. We're all eating together. And I can remember going in the kitchen and Nick and Nora's Lutheran grandmother came to me <laughs> and she caught me in the kitchen and she looked at me in the eye and she said, you know those kids have been baptized already, don't you? <laughs> I, said, I said, what? <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't know. And she said, oh, yes. They were baptized as infants, and I can't remember the name of the is it Lutheran Church in Enid. And I said, oh, well, that was not made clear to me, you know, at the beginning of the service. And the, the bad thing was, was that family never darkened the doors again of that church. You see, they were looking at that. The parents were seeing that as that they needed somehow believer's baptism to make it valid. And then everything was great. This idea of it's all about just the belief, and if we get that down, it's kind of like we've had it baptized and confirmed, and now they're inoculated against any kind of sin, and they're free to go. You know, you don't even need a booster shot. <laughs> you know, you're good. And that's going to Jesus by night. It really is. That's an important understanding for us to have that we, we've got to make our faith more consistent. We've got to claim Jesus all the time. A friend of mine is a chair of the Board of Warning Ministry in a, a different conference from this one. Uh, she's in the southeastern jurisdiction, and she had a, a uh, cabinet member, a district superintendent, call her and ask her about a particular candidate that was in the process of going through the process of becoming ordained, and they're still a probationary member of their annual conference. This particular pastor, who was serving under probation in the provisional process, was really tanking. <laughs> Just not a very good pastor. Sometimes this happens when you get through the process and you find out, you know, you can pass the interviews okay, that you have the knowledge, but when it comes to actual practice, you, they just don't put it all together and they're just bad. And that's what's going on here. And they said, you know, we, this person is unappointable. We can't send them to another church. The, this one's already, you know, gone way downhill. And because of the kind of issues that they have, we just don't think they're going to be able to be fixed. And she says, what I was thinking about doing, this is what the superintendent said, I'm thinking about maybe what if we could have the board of ordained ministry appoint them to maybe some kind of continuing education, some kind of classes to where they can get, you know, maybe learn some of this stuff and get back better. And, and she said that the chair said, well, who's going to pay for that? It's like, oh, yeah. Uh, you know, that money just didn't come out of nowhere. You know, you can't just pull that money off the conference tree and just say, hey, we're going we're gonna to pay for this. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And really what the issue is, is it was a supervisory issue. It's the act that the superintendent needs to sit down with that pastor and have a very messy and difficult conversation to say, you know, I'm sorry what we've gotten through to this point, but it doesn't appear that you have the fruit, that you really have the gifts that we need to serve as a pastor in our churches. That's a tough conversation. I wouldn't want to have it. It's difficult to have it. But it needs to happen. And when we're kind of running the end around, when we're saying, well, maybe we could just appoint them here or do this other or you know, try to find a place, we're going to Jesus by night, in a sense. Instead of having the very difficult conversation with someone that we need to have. And I think all of us can identify with that sense of trying to get around some other way rather than do the confrontation which is, you know, you and I know that's very difficult. Very difficult. And yet sometimes that's exactly what we're called to do. There was a youth minister. Uh, when I served as a youth minister, I had a family there in our church that was excellent, and they were there every Sunday. Very faithful people. And I was holding elections for the middle school group, the mid-high group. And I said, okay, if you're going to serve as president of the middle school group, you've got to come to the elections and I want you to make a speech and I want you to tell your qualifications and I want you to kind of lay out 
what your plans are, your vision for the youth group for the year. And you're going to share that with the other kids. And then they're going to vote on whichever one they think is right for the job. And that's how, that's how we're going to hold their elections. And so I want you to put some thought into it. Well, this family came to me and they, their youngest daughter was interested in running. And she would have been excellent. She would have been very good. But she was going to have to miss the elections. And I said, well, why, why can't you be there? And she said, well, we've got soccer practice. And I said, oh, well, well that's unfortunate. And she said, well, no, you don't understand. See, if, if we don't go to practice, we can't play in the game. And I said, oh, that's, that's unfortunate. It looks like you've got a choice to make. <laughs> and then they got mad at me. <laughs> they got mad at me. Now, let me just say this. They didn't get mad at the soccer coach. They got mad at me. We're trying to hold up the same stand. I'm not doing anything different than they're doing, and yet they're mad at me. Why is that? Why would they be mad at me? It's, it's this idea that, well, you know, these other things are temporary, and church is always going to be there. And so once this temporary thing's over, we'll get back to the church. And you know what that means is, is that the church ends up always coming second or third or fourth in our lives. And we're, we're sharing this information with our children in a very real and meaningful way to say, really, the church is not that important. It does not hold value over and above these other things in society. And then when our children get to become adults and they end up not going to church, our parents wonder why this is. It's because they've learned the lessons we've taught them. We're going to Jesus by night. Okay, if I haven't stepped on your toes yet, get ready. <laughs> Scrunch up your toes in your shoes. Uh, this next story will get you. If, I, uh, the, if you went to Disciple last week, you heard this already. I, I kind of talked about this in Disciple Bible Study. It was a story about a pastor who was appointed to a church, and he got to this wonderful little church, and they had a nice flagpole out in the, in the uh, yard, and on it they had the American flag up and then right underneath the Christian flag. And so when the pastor got there, he took the flags down and he reversed them. And he put the Christian flag on top and then the American flag and put them back up the pole. Now, do you know anything about flag etiquette? Yeah. <laughs> Jim's like, yeah. What is, is that a no-no? That's a no-no. Yeah. Is it, well, you can't do that. The American flag clearly is on top. That's how it is. That's how the, how the rules, we're following the rules. And so somebody got to the church, one of the lay people, went over to the flag, pulled them down, put it back like it should have been, put it right back up, and left it there. Well, the pastor sees that. He comes out, and he puts them back the way it was. This went on several times, back and forth, going before a conversation ever happened. And finally, they had to confront him. Why do you keep putting the flag? They found out as a pastor. Why do you keep putting the Christian flag? The American flag has to go on top. And he said, well, you know, it just seems like this is a kind of an important thing to talk about, our values. You know, what do we really value here as the church? Which one is the most important as the church? Well, you know, flag etiquette says the flag, the American flag has to go on top. And the pastor said, well, yeah, but the Ten Commandments, they say, have no other gods before me. Which one do we hold is more important? Are we setting the President of the United States above Jesus? <laughs> Ooh. That's difficult. You know, these kind of ideas, as we think about it, it just that story just kind of gets us just to think. What do we really value? What do we hold true? How are we going to Jesus by night? You know, a lot of us look at that and we hear that story. Nicodemus is coming at nighttime. He didn't want the other Pharisees to know he's coming to Jesus. It's easy to throw stones at Nicodemus until we start to look at ourselves. And then when I feel, after I look at myself a little bit on some of these issues, I think, well, you know, Nicodemus is not that bad. <laughs> and he eventually did come around. Am I really embracing my faith by living it? 
when I claim, I claim to believe in Jesus, I claim to be a Christian, we are, wear crosses and all these things, but do we really embrace it? Are we born from above? Are we born again? Nicodemus, unsure at first, later came to kind of help Jesus out, and then finally ends up helping to bury our Lord after the crucifixion. The fact that he's referenced three times in John's Gospel indicates to me that Nicodemus was known by the early church, lifted up in a sense as one of the eventual leaders of the early church, finally did come to walk in the light, to come to Jesus during the day. May you and I repent of those times when we haven't fully claimed Jesus. And may we know what it is to walk together during the day, in the light, together as the body of Christ. And may the world see our action and take notice. Amen.